Hello and welcome to History at Home from the Australian National Maritime Museum. My name is Richard Wood. I'm the Senior Manager of USA Programs at the museum. Let's begin by acknowledging the traditional owners. The Australian National Maritime Museum acknowledges the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of the Bamal land and the Badu, the waters on which we work. We also acknowledge all traditional custodians of the lands and waters throughout Australia and pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders past and present. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and other viewers are advised that this History at Home session may contain the voices, images, names, words and works of art of people who have died. This afternoon's session um, is about saving our seas. Um, and I'd like to remind you that if you have a question to ask, please click on the Q&A icon box at the bottom of the screen um, for us to read your questions. I'd like to begin by talking about a new exhibition the museum is hosting when we reopen called One Ocean, Our Future. It's a USA program sponsored by the Schmidt Ocean Institute, supported by the museum's USA Bicentennial Gift Fund, and with the assistance and cooperation of many Australian and international scientific and research organisations. It's also an endorsed event of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. The exhibition is about our one vast ocean and how it affects life on Earth and how global warming is affecting all that the ocean influences. Although the ocean is vast, it's finite and its resources are limited. As our modern way of life produces pollutants and greenhouse gases, average global temperatures rise and the ocean is changing. The exhibition opens by pointing out that there are still wonders to be found in the ocean. Even though it's critical to the existence of life on Earth and it's a mesmerizing place, the ocean remains mysterious and mainly unexplored. So in the exhibition, a big screen movie shows high definition vision of deep ocean topography and life found around Australia that was captured by the Schmidt Ocean Institute's remote operating vehicle, Sebastian. I always find it amazing to think that no human eyes have actually looked at this piece of seafloor before. The exhibition then uses uh, very large graphics that you might call them billboards to introduce the exhibition themes. These carry stories from across the globe about the influences of the ocean on different aspects of nature and society. Whether as the ocean warms and the pattern of droughts and storms and rail, rainfall changes, it changes how we live on the planet. Habitat. As the ocean becomes more acidic and the sea levels rise, plants and animals migrate to new places. Some die out, some thrive, things change. Where and how we live is also likely to change. The exhibition uses witnesses, in this case, First Nation witnesses, through the artworks from the museum's collection by First Nation artists from Australia and across the Pacific, we see the expression of First Nation reactions to a changing ocean. So in this slide from left to right, Alison Murray's saltwater bagu, Clarence Kinjun's marine bagu, and Doris Kinjun's Baraguli Baramundi bagu. We also let the witnesses speak for themselves. From across the globe, from Scotland to Alaska, to South America, to Australia, to the Pacific Islands. The voices of experience from across the globe and from the very young to the very old populate the space in this exhibition as an ambient soundscape. And I think we can hear a witness, um, an American scientist in, in the Arctic. The Arctic is warming faster than other regions, and that means that we're seeing these changes in some 
faster than you would in, in other places. How much faster? Is there a way of measuring it? It's at least twice as fast. Really? Yeah, the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet. So when that permafrost thaws, it's like we're opening the freezer door and we're allowing all of that carbon to start, it becomes food for microbes and it starts decomposing and it produces greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane. And so from Indonesian fishing, fishers to um, Torres Strait Island, um, people whose islands are quite literally being inundated through to champions of the ocean, such as Valerie Taylor. Um, we allow the voices of these witnesses to change, express and give us food for thought within the exhibition. Science is very important in this exhibition. We actually include in each of the billboards um, visualization of data in ways that take data from multiple sources and condense it into a single visual form. Um, and science, the science billboard itself, the science um, theme of the exhibition includes stories and objects from almost 200 years of ocean science. We're very excited using the theme of ice in collaboration with the Australian Antarctic Division to have an ice core on display in the exhibition. It dates from about 1756 or around the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and um, studying that core of ice has enabled the Australian Antarctic Division to understand the levels of pollutant, the changes in the atmosphere that have occurred since then. Now, the ice core is in its purpose-built freezer and very luckily, um, the power for that 24-hour freezer is going to be offset by the museum's massive um, photovoltaic cell array um, on its Wharf 7 buildings. And I think we've got a happy scientist on the next slide with an ice core. And finally, we talk, oh, plastic. Okay, a major ocean pollutant. It's probably very topical. It's very front of mind for many of us, but some of the stories of ocean pollution are quite hard to even imagine and to, um, to quantify. But this billboard, interestingly, as a background, just see it, includes plastic fibers that are now being found in the colon of human beings from the water we drink, which relates to the weather, the ocean and water pollution. And finally, progress. Not wanting this exhibition to be anything but inspirational in both the way it provokes thought and question, but also the way it um, represents um, what happens next because we're talking about sustainable development of the ocean we have a, a subject called progress and that's stories about the big and the small achievements that are being made in recognizing measuring and addressing ocean sustainability now i'd like to introduce kaylee bartnick kaylee is an early career assistant curator of special projects at the museum she has a bachelor of marine science and over a decade of art training that she brings together in her work focusing on marine science and communication. So over to you, Kaylee. Thank you, Richard. And hello, I'm coming from Cadigal land and I'm going to expand on some of the stories that Richard has spoken about um, in relation to each content um, topic that we have chosen for the exhibition. Uh, we included quite a lot of stories. So we were able to include quite diverse topics um, across the billboards that we made and also give some time to um, have a look at some viewpoints that don't get as much um, media attention as say the plight of polar bears and so with that I wanted to start with the ice topic and we are looking at Stelvio Pass in um, Italy. Here is where the White War occurred and this was between the Italian and Austro-Hungarian soldiers it was fought at freezing conditions in under 30 degrees Celsius at really high altitudes, um, around three and a half thousand meters um, above sea level. And with this um, ice and glacier international problem of um, unprecedented melting, uh, the Stelvio passes started to encounter climate conditions from these early 1900s um, today. 
And so with this ice melting, um, we've actually been able to find these old artifacts being revealed through the ice. And so now the ice has proceeded. Um, you can see here these photos from the White War Museum of some of the relics that have been uncovered. Um, other things that they also found were letters, weapons, bones, and there were unfortunately also remains of two young Austro Austrian soldiers as well. And this is an interesting um, crossover between museums and science as this um, unfortunate occurrence in our climate has meant that we actually get a little window into some of our past. For museums, we get to see um, an historical event that happened between humans, but for science, they get to um, have a look at a weather event um, from times gone by. And the next crossover as well comes from New Zealand um, for our next topic that is um, about the weather. So a global research project has come out of New Zealand where they are using citizen scientists to help transcribe logbooks um, that were from the ships that did voyages through the middle of the 1800s into the middle of the 1900s as well. Um, the citizen scientists are just members of the public that have volunteered their time to take these handwritten logs um, that are meticulously detailed. They're taken every day by different members of these um, voyages and they're making them accessible to science. So they're becoming digital records and from here scientists can use these to have a look at old weather patterns, um, help to understand our past and then they are able to make predictions for our weather in the future as well as um, the effects that climate change would have in tandem with these. In this photo on the right hand side from the State Library of Victoria, um, this is the ship that traveled between Australia, Canada and New Zealand in the early 1900s and this would have been a prime candidate um, to be used in this project. Um, our next topic is plastics and I think this is only regarding to um, plastics that are in the ocean, so ocean pollution. I think that the best analogy when thinking about this issue is that of the running tap and a bathtub. So many efforts can be quite futile if you just keep trying to remove the water from a bathtub and it would be much more helpful if you turned the tap off. Um, so when it comes to talking about management plans um, for plastic pollution, um, it is important for us to look at where these sources are coming from. This study in the University of New South Wales that came out recently has found one of their largest sources is the culprit, which is our domestic laundry wastewater. And here we can see these fibres in this photo. Uh, these come off our synthetically made clothes. Um, it is a great human invention of different um, needs that human have, um, need of clothes and for specialized tasks that need synthetic fibers to be used. However, these innovations did not historically include um, the environment in their creation. So now we have these things called microfibers or microplastics, um, which come off our clothes during the friction of a washing cycle. And they can be classified here as a microplastic, which is um, also a shard or just a fiber that can be from five millimeters in length or less. Um, and as Richard also pointed out, um, since 2019, we've also been using the term nanoplastic. And this is for um, pieces that are less than 0 0.01 um, millimeters as well. And with this, um, when you do your washing, so these things are just so small that they don't get trapped in our usual lint filters. And so they do come out in that affluent of our wastewater. These tiny fibers are actually the majority of um, plastic that we now find in the ocean. And so I think that this points to a good look or overhaul of the synthetic textile industry as well, um, in line with also having a look at our fashion industries, which are one of the world's largest greenhouse gas polluters, um, contributing about three to 10% of um, carbon emissions internationally each year. Um, so now we can look at progress. Um, that's our next topic. Um, this is one of my favorite stories that we included. Um, I find it really inspiring. Um, it is between this partnership with Future Feed, um, the CSIRO, Meat and Livestock Australia and James Cook University. Um, they did a study that released 
um, data about this red seaweed that you can see in this photo here called Asparagopsis. It is a species that is native to Australian coastal waters and they found that if you fed it, fed it to cows um, in their normal feed, they actually reduced the methane emissions from cows from 80 to 98 percent. And with this, um, methane is a lot more potent compared to carbon emissions. And so this is a really good um, way of drastically um, attacking some of our emissions. They have taken this study further into an actual company called Seaforest. Um, they are, it was based by um, a founder called Sam Elson. He is in Tasmania um, with the company that has created a farmland as well. Um, algae farming is one of our most untapped sources of sustainable farming, um, mostly because they don't need to be fed. Um, they photosynthesize um, and use the energy from the sun uh, to keep growing. So they become a really, really good um, source for this feed. Uh, they found that um, Australia only has 3% of the cows that are purposed for agricultural use. Um, and from a few grants that just um, arrived for this company Seaforest, they've been able to take this into a greater commercialization phase. Um, and they will be able to make seaweed meal that could be used um, all over the globe and help um, to reduce these emissions to the other 97% um, of the agricultural industry um, as well. And so we can look at their cousin next um, in habitat. This is um, looking at our unsung heroes that are seagrasses. So seagrasses, uh, next slide please, thank you. Um, seagrasses are um, humans and the natural environment's unsung heroes, I think. Um, they only cover 0.1% of the ocean floor. However, they trap up to 18% of ocean carbon. As I've written here, so over 25% of the CO2 that we produce as humans annually ends up being absorbed by our ocean. Seagrasses are part of what we call the ocean carbon sink in the ocean. Um, it is one of the biological ways that the ocean traps our heat um, that has come out and it serves a whole lot of other ecological functions as well. As you can see here with the seagrass trapped in the sand, it also helps to um, keep sand and coastlines together. This prevents erosion, um, which has become a larger problem during climate change with more erratic sea conditions. Um, it also becomes a buffer. Um, buffers help to protect us and the natural environment from more extreme weather events. And these are also predicted to happen more frequently um, and more extremely over time. These also work together with mangroves and sea marshes that also protect our juvenile fish around the coastlines. Um, and they all hold a lot more carbon than their land um, and terrestrial counterparts. So seagrasses take up to um, 40 times faster carbon and they store it for potentially much longer in terms of thousands of years compared to the average tropical rainforest. And they are also um, looking forward, one of our um, greatest possibilities for restoration of the environment. Um, internationally, seagrasses have been declining all over the world. Here in Australia, we have a program called Operation Posidonia, which is trying to um, restore, restore a um, seagrass population that was here in Australia um, that has now disappeared nearly all over our coastlines. And I think this is one of the best options that we have for human intervention as we can restore it back to previous levels that we have experienced and also um, seen how they actually worked. And along with this coastal erosion, we have our last story from our science and technology um, panel. This is focused in Beachport, South Australia. You can see here in this black and white photo, this is from the 1940s and compared to the 2016, they have um, had 135 metres of sand and coastal erosion within this short length of time. You can see this white part in this black and white photo is where the um, sand coastline used to exist. And now over to the right, it has receded all the way back to here. And on the left-hand side, we have a third year student named Samuel Davidson, who is from Flinders University. 
um, but he has been using this GPS controlled robotic vessel. It has been tracking the sand um, where it has been transported to, uh, the depths of the sand, and this was in line with other scientific research that they are carrying out um, to have a look at what's happening to the beaches of um, South Australia. And um, in terms of science and technology, this is one of our best helpers. It is um, safer um, than humans using it. It's cheaper. It is more efficient at collecting data and collecting large amounts of data. And this helps them to have a look at prediction rates for the future and informing management plans as well. Now, I won't talk anymore about science and technology because Emily is going to do that for us. So I'd like to introduce Emily to everybody. So Emily Tetev is our curator of ocean science and technology. Her role includes exhibitions, programs, and collections acquisition, as well as management of the museum's 10 year program of exhibitions, events, collections, and programs in support of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development from this year until 2030. Thank you, Kaylee. Can you hear me? Good, because I can't see myself or hear myself, so I'm hoping everyone can hear and see me. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a couple of objects in the Museum of Science and Technology collection. How humans sample the ocean and what tools they use is massively important for understanding how the ocean works and how it's changing. This is part of our national maritime story. The museum is building a collection of historic and contemporary technological objects as designed, developed and used in Australian and international waters. I am thrilled that many of these newly donated objects are going to be included in the new exhibition, One Ocean, Our Future. I'm gonna highlight a couple of them, tell you a bit about where they came from, what they do, and how these innovations help us to better understand the ocean. We'll start with one of my favorites. This is the continuous plankton recorder. It is a part of the continuous plankton survey, which is the longest running marine biological survey in the world. Museum's collection object is a CPR type two Mark I. It kind of looks like something out of the Rocketeer to me. I love this little thing. Now that's because it's probably one of the first CPRs ever sent to Australia. There were two CPRs, CPR 13, which was sent in 1939-1940, or CPR 105, sent in 1966. Now the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery have CPR 122, which also dates to 1966, excuse me. And it looks significantly different. So while I can't say anything for sure here, we haven't been able to observe the number on the nose cone of the CPR as yet, but I am trending to think that it could be CPR 13, which means the museum would have the oldest CPR in Australia in our collection, which would be great. Now the continuous plankton recorder sur survey started in 1931. This object was donated to the museum by CSIRO. It was found in a, in a closet in the University of Queensland laboratory which is a fantastic find. And I bet you wanna know how it works. Now the CPR is towed behind a ship at about a depth of about 10 meters. Water passes through an aperture at the front and water and plankton present within the water are sandwiched between two pieces of silk. The silk are spooled on a cassette and then put into a storage tank containing formalin, which helps preserve the plankton. On return to the laboratory on board the ship, the silks are divided into sections representing 10 nautical miles of tow, or about 19 kilometers. Then the plankton are assessed. So you can look at it, a greenness index, which estimates phytoplankton or plant biomass, or microscopic analyses that count and identify zooplankton, animals, and phytoplankton, again, plants, to species level. These data are correlated with environmental data collected during the tows, like location, water temperature, salinity. Matching this with the collected information on presence or absence or density of plankton over 100 plus years provides vital information on the health of our ocean. Now, one of the key aspects of oceanography is understanding the chemical and physical properties of water. In the late 19th century, Norwegian explorer and scientist Richtof Nansen invented a water sampling bottle called a Nansen bottle. This is one of the first ocean water samplers, but there are many different types of water sampling bottles. They're all used to collect water samples to test salinity or dissolve salt content and oxygen levels at different depths. 
When the bottle reaches a desired depth, a weight called a messenger is dropped down the line, which trips shut the open double-ended container and collects a sample. The bottle is also fitted with a reversing thermometer, which is externally mounted. You can see a little bit of the edge there. And that measures water temperature for each collected sample. Now this image is a collection between how messenger weights are stored in the field in a bag and how they are cared for by the conservation team at the museum once they enter the National Maritime Collection, which is this beautiful, beautiful, well-organized box. Now salinometers use electric, electrical conductivity to measure the salinity of seawater samples recovered by Nansen bottles and other bottles. In 1958, Australian Neil Brown invented a salinometer that uses an inductive cell for temperature compensation to allow for high accuracy without temperature control. Brown later teamed up with oceanographer Bruce Harmon to create a portable model. And that's what you can see here in the museum's collection. This is better suited to things like short coastal research expeditions. Now these were eventually replaced by the CTD or conductivity temperature and depth systems. Version of this is also developed by Neil Brown. The modern CTD frame has a mounted series of between six and 24 Niskin bottles. You can see the Niskin bottle on your left. That's sort of the current version of the earlier Nansen bottle. Again, designed to describe discrete water samples from targeted depths. Now the CTD is used all over the world, also often referred to as a sonde. It's used by researchers on board vessels like RV Investigator to sample and record water conductivity, temperature, and pressure. Other sensors may be added to the cluster that measure chemical or biological parameters. You can see this here, like chlorophyll fluorescence or dissolved oxygen. Now the CTD is a crucial tool for data collection on the holistic marine environment. This includes things like ocean circulation, species distribution, and changing ocean conditions. Did you know that there are almost 4,000 floats worldwide throughout the ocean helping scientists um, investigate climate change? This is the MRV Solo 2 array for real-time geostrophic oceanography, also known lovingly as an Argo float. There's a network of battery operated neutrally buoyant floats that works to create a comprehensive profile of the world's oceans. Now each float records data on the surface for 10 days, you can see the graphic here, syncs to record at one kilometer and two kilometer depths, and then returns to the surface to transmit data to shore by satellite. Each cylinder has temperature, conductivity, depth, and pressure sensors. Wave height and swell, current speed and direction, and ocean temperature data are used to locate fishery stocks, resource management, storm forecasting, and help predict future ocean climate. Together with other instruments like drifting buoys and ferry boxes and underwater gliders, Argo floats contribute to what is known as the Global Ocean Observing System. Like many things in the ocean science world, this long-standing border crossing internationally collaborative program just quietly works. This map shows the scale of the Argo network in 2021. Now, sometimes these floats do require replacement. In 19, oh, 19, in 2018, the museum's replica ship Endeavour crossed the Tasman Sea, and we were lucky enough to help CSIRO redeploy to Argo floats on that voyage. I do hope that we get to do this again. Now, uncrewed surface vessels like the LCS Blue Bottle series are meeting one of the world's biggest marine challenges in, head on. With environmentally sustainable solar powered rigid opening sails and hybrid marine power, this little beauty can be loaded up with whatever equipment and electronics you need and sent out to sea at days at a time. Data is transmitted back to shore via satellite, allowing operators to monitor ocean conditions, hazards, security, and surveillance. A fleet of these operating in Australian waters saves time, money, and paints a comprehensive picture of our vast marine estate in real time. Like the Australian Maritime College Nupiri Muka Polar AUV, the Queensland University of Technology Ranger Bot, fleets of tiny little mapping robots in development at University of Sydney, and other cutting edge tech. This object is representative of a shift in ocean technology, moving towards safer and more sustainable alternatives to explore, monitor, and quantify ocean environments. The advantages for scientific research and maritime industries allow greater safety for staff, higher output and coverage, 
which can now include environments that are unsuitable for humans or too costly to support traditional vessels for sustained at sea work. In the future of marine surveillance and oceanic mapping is autonomous. And the blue bottles are a vital step for Australia in meeting our increasing needs to manage, inform and protect our marine estate. Now the museum is deeply grateful to all who recognize the importance of history and understanding our contemporary world and perhaps our deeply unsettling projected planetary future. With just these few objects, you can see the vast area covered, data collected and information gained. With the CPR survey, you see the collection and assessment of plankton, the tiniest inhabitants of the ocean and the base of the marine food web. What affects them affects us all. What a brilliant thing to have figured out so early on and to keep going for more than 100 years. I do hope it goes on forever. Water sampling methods. Although containers have changed and technologically developed, the information that is collected stays about the same. To understand the ocean and how it fluctuates, the absolute base information we need is the composition of water. International collaboration provides solutions to the world's biggest problems, like the Goose Network and the thousands of Argo floats collecting information from everywhere. This is a kind of game-changing global data collection that is only possible through the spirit of science. Autonomous technologies like the NEMO, these allow us to meet the economic cost of ocean-going research head on and pave the way to a future where we can care for and monitor our oceans without involving too many people, ships, and tons of fuel. I mean, I love going to sea, but we have to admit that robots are probably the future. We all want to know how to save our seas. The key takeaway here is that while we need to make the changes that we can in our everyday lives, we also need to remember that there's a crack team of trained professionals with excellent technology working on solutions. You want to save the oceans, trust science. Now this growing collection at the National Maritime Museum is only possible because a number of individuals and organizations have shared their time, their knowledge and facilitated donations. For this talk, I would particularly like to thank the people listed here and to all of you for tuning in today. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Kaylee. And I must point out behind me is my little friend, Jumbo Octopus. In the exhibition, we also have what we call a virtual 3D aquarium where four, no, six of the specimens discovered by research vessel Falcor from the Schmidt Ocean Institute on its expeditions around Australia with Australian scientists on board. Um, where visitors will be able to, without touching them, um, discover more about these creatures, uh, bring them up as it were into a three dimensional space, spin them around, learn about their habitats, etc. cetera. So um, yeah, there's Dumbo, we have faceless cat sharks, we have, oh, we have cat sharks and faceless cusp, cusp eels and all sorts of um, fabulous uh, specimens from Australian oceans. Now, um, we, uh, I can now hand over to you, the viewers um, who've joined us for questions and answers. Um, I think I should also point out that everything that Kaylee has spoken of and Emily has spoken of um, is in the exhibition and much, much more. So the artifacts, the historical collection, and some histori uh, historical artifacts that we've borrowed that give us a really great timeline of oceanography and ocean science. Lots and lots of the stories that Kay Lee was elucidating. Um, I think there's about 60 or 65 stories within the exhibition. There's a predictive um, graph of what life might be like in a hundred years time for a child born in 2021. These are all part of, of the experience we're creating within the exhibition. Now, if I can just go to questions, Lynn has asked, and perhaps this is for you, Emily, are there any concerns and evidence of nuclear waste in the ocean? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, nuclear waste in the ocean, well, we know there is some, and uh, a lot of the analysis of nuclear waste has been in terrestrial environments so far. I mean, we have some pretty interesting data from some of the first atomic test sites in the Pacific, which were on um, unpopulated islands. 
and watching how they have recovered from that. We also have evidence of nuclear waste being dumped into the ocean. But as a major pollutant, it's not really on the same discussive level as some of the other things like ocean acidification. It's really lumped under ocean marine pollution as, a, as sort of a broader issue. Mm. I think this is the part of science that's um, hard and it's also um, similar to the microplastic waste. Um, unless we have sort of the quantifying science done first, that also takes its time to be done before you get to the point of starting to analyze the effects of these things. Um, so while we are still um, trying to find what is there, and so far I think the studies have just said that they've been negligible um, or there's just a lack of studies, um, we're still a long way off on like finding what these effects are and they're a lot harder to also deduce. It's Kaylee's totally right. Like just building on that, one of the things that why I was talking about the Nemo is, you know, you send a research ship out and I love, I love research ship. I would spend all of my time on research ship, but it costs so much money to send one out to sea for just a couple of weeks, you know, which is why it's great that we have research vessels in Australia. And you have a set plan, and that plan is usually set a couple of years in advance. And it all has to fit in with the national or international priority of areas. So just like Kaylee said, some of these things, we just don't have all the data yet. Mm -hmm. And that's what science needs is, is data and time. And mo money always helps. <laughs> and some more robots to help us do it for us, because that's like 50 scientists per robot out in the field. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Just going back to that question on nuclear waste, um, I find it fascinating that, in fact, um, shipwrecks that have been preserved under the ocean, uh, steel shipwrecks, um, are a source of basically non-polluted or non-nuclear steel, so steel made from before the nuclear age, and that this is quite sought after for making very delicate scientific instruments and things. That's something I've learned from working with the museum's archaeologists. We have a question. Um, are all the states and territories looking to reintroduce or introduce a seagrass rehabilitation program, Kaylee? Is it nationwide? I think it's affected nationwide with, um, I'm not, I only know of Operation Posidonia that's specifically looking at Posidonia. So that used to be, um, a lot more prevalent along Australian coastlines, um, but there are many other types of seaweeds as well around Australia. Um, but that is a national study and it's with quite a few different universities with the New South Wales fisheries. I think it's focused on New South Wales, but the same sort of um, work is done internationally. They use um, like grids that you can put um, tie onto the seagrasses, um, onto each of the crossover knots, and you can put them into the ocean. Um, these aren't just in New South Wales or just in this project. Um, they're all over the world, just like uh, coral planting and the coral trees that they're putting in um, too. So um, I think it could be. Um, I'm just not sure what the other names of them would be in particular. And there's also, isn't there, um, moves to use mangrove um, rehabilitation in coastal uh, work? Yeah, that should be done in tandem. They all work really well. The mangroves are a good um, like brackish area as well. So they become really good like habitats for things like crabs and other juvenile fish as well. But they hold a lot of carbon in their trunks. Like that's more fibrous than the seagrass too. But they do take longer, just like trees take longer than um, terrestrial grass to grow as well. So all of them, all of the options, all of the natural options would all be good. Um, also, the sea marshes have also been in decline as well. Um, and they're all over Australia, but not just Australia, out in the Pacific too. So I would advocate for all of them to be um, equally held and moved forward. And isn't it right that the seagrass, like as the seagrass dies, that mat of seagrass builds up. So it's not just the green stuff on top, it's actually the carbon that's been sequestered in that mat of, of material that could be centuries old. Yeah, so it's like when we dig up fossil fuels as well. So like disturbing those areas or when they get taken out by 
um, a large cyclone or storm that disturbs the sediment that brings up old carbon that could be thousands of years old as well. Um, and with different levels of sea rise, um, the area that covers seagrass now um, could be much more extended out further than what we can see today. So it's, um, it's a large area of stored carbon and um, further inland with uh, mangroves as well. Oh, um, another question from Lynn, and I think this is very topical, considering you raised the story yourself, Kaylee. was, do we know how long it will be before we can actually purchase meat that's been fed on methane-lowering feed, such as the seaweed feed? Do we know, is it, is it already commercially available? Um, I think it's gone past like the experimental trial phase. I'm not sure if of like the tracking phase of like it actually being used by cows, but I do know that they have also um, done a really cool study with sheep um, that they've tried to make carbon neutral merino wool with um, the brand MJ Bale. Um, so that's also like a nice, um, like a living, <laughs> version um, of still being carbon neutral for um, a living animal and while sheep are going to produce merino wool regardless. Um, so I know that they're still continuing their studies um, and they just got a Morrison grant that was for like a million dollars. So they've got some really good funding behind them to do a lot more things. So I think they're going into the commercializ commercialization phase now. Um, so it, I mean, as long as it gets taken up by individual companies in the industry, it could be a short turnover from now. Uh, another question from this time from Amy. Are estrogens produced by plastics interfering with fish reproduction, given how much plastic is in the ocean? Emily? Sorry, could you repeat that, please, Richard? Are estrogens produced by plastics interfering with fish reproduction? That's a question from Amy. Uh, you'd have to ask a fisheries biologist, <laughs> which neither of us are, to get the details on, on that, actually. Um, but I know that, like most of us, plastics are interfering with a, a lot of the things we do. I just watched a fascinating expose on Teflon last night, which is very exciting. I won't get into that either. But um, yeah, I'd recommend asking your local fisheries biologist. Uh, and for Marjorie, um, the octopus is a Dumbo octopus. I don't quite know its scientific name. It's, it is well known as a Dumbo octopus. Um, and there's one part of the big film in the exhibition, the big screen movie, where I've never heard so many scientists excited about finding a sleeping Dumbo, which then wakes up. And you just get this group hug almost of of them finding this Dumbo octopus at the deep ocean reaches around Australia. Um, Nerida has asked, what is the time lag between real-time data and sharing that data with the broader community from the point of view of scientific research? Emily? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, it's something that a lot of organisations have been looking into quite deeply, particularly over the last couple of years. Um, CSIRO, Marine National Facility used some of the downtime during last year's COVID lockdown to revamp some of their data collection and uh, management databases. So now that they are integrated with some of the other national organizations, you know, so Geoscience Australia, who takes management over quite a, all the seafloor mapping and Australian um, seafloor mapping databases. That's now integrated into the CSIRO database. So that's that two-way real-time sharing. And we've also done similar things with some of the cultural heritage sites so that those are layered in the database. So a lot of this stuff can be rapidly shared between government organizations or equal partners like that. Um, things like the Goose Network, the Global Ocean Observing uh, Network, those are all, again, accessible. This is one of the major issues and major topics of the ocean decade is, okay, if we get all of these data sets and they're helping to inform the health and safety of our ocean over a major period of time, where are we going to store them? And how can we ensure that they are open access so that people can actually use them. 
And there are a lot of sovereignty issues around that data use and data transfer. And there are governments who are a little bit uncomfortable with sharing the location of some particular features. So that's a really big issue is um, open access data transfer and uh, real time data transfer, because, yeah, yeah, I mean, as a as a maritime archaeologist, I know that sometimes there can be quite a long period of time between when you do the field work and when you actually write the report and share the information with the public. So everyone's very conscious of limiting that time frame as much as possible. And I know there have been a couple of questions about alternate food sources from the ocean with regard to food security, etc. I know there's a story in one of the billboards about eating jelly blubber. Um, an Australian scientist has researched eating jelly blubber um, as a major food source, um, high in protein, easy to um, easy to um, grow. Um, so we don't get heavily in the exhibition into that, but we do look at some of the alternate food sources. And I know, Kaylee, in the Child of the Future proposition in the exhibition, you talk about how food resources will change as the ocean changes. Um, yeah, well, basically, we even outside of the ocean, we have a lot of untapped um, types of foods that do grow. I mean, of like the vegetables that we eat, we have like hundreds of thousands that still aren't being used, but can be edible um, and quite nutritious for us. Um, things like jellyfish, they're able to clone um, a lot easier. And that's like their mode of reproduction compared to fish um, where their genetic data gets just um, mated between two of the fish. So it's harder to take large quantities of fish without damaging their populations. But something like um, jellyfish, they are a lot easier to reproduce um, with less damaging um, consequences, if not done um, as like diversely or um, well planned out sometimes. So it's a bit of like a net there. Um, but things like even like seaweed, um, seaweed farming is very nutritious. Um, it is a lot, it uses less water, it uses less land because in the ocean, it can be done in hatcheries, um, aquaculture farming. Um, we have a lot of untapped, more sustainable resources, um, even like things like moringa in um, like the land, even things that can grow quite nutritiously um, in arid and di very difficult conditions. Um, so it's a good field and I think it, I won't eat crickets, but I think there's like things like that, that we can move towards to in future. And I think our diets will look different soon and maybe also less meat consumption. We've got like those, well, there's like lab grown chicken nuggets now. Um, so we've got lots of options. I'm sure to look forward to in the future. Uh, and I think we've got one last question from P Dexter and that is, do we know if sustainable oceans are on the agenda at the upcoming Glasgow conference? So where does global, global leadership sit on the subject? Um, is it the UN? So what's the question? Is, is the question that are sustainable oceans on the agenda at, um, at, that, at the upcoming Glasgow conference? They certainly are. Yeah. Uh, the, the, you, the United Nations and the International Oceanographic Commission have joined forces really to, to put forward this decade in support of uh, sustainable development for the oceans. And I think it's really this international understanding that 70% of our ocean requires as much um, attention as the other 30 point. 70% uh, of our planet requires as much attention. And, and that this decade has actually already received a little bit more focus and international attention than sometimes a lot of the UN decades do. Um, so we're off to a rip roaring start in 2021, even though lockdown has impacted many people. And it's definitely on the agenda. People understand that this is the future of our food security. We've all been uh, recently impacted by shipping concerns. So we really need to ensure that we have a sustainable shipping future, sustainable transport future. 
Uh, you can see some of the fantastic designs for how people are looking back to look forward with uh, giant inflatable sails on container ships that will come out in the next 50 years. So I think everyone's really understanding and, and really acknowledging at that level that, that we do need to start caring a bit more for the ocean. I mean, our own government, we have the, uh, um, the Prime Minister sits on the ocean panel. So I have great hope for the future. So um, if we've got one more slide to, to finish up with Emily, and um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. I'm in Sydney, it's a beautiful afternoon. And that brings our event to a close, but it doesn't end the History at Home series. Um, if you'd like to, one, come to the museum and see the One Ocean Our Future exhibition, which really is a very enveloping experience um, once we reopen. And if you'd like to join us next week for the next History at Home, which is Smuggled, an illegal history of journeys to Australia, where the museum's Dr. Peter Hobbins in a book club style chat talks with authors Ruth Balant and Julie Kalman about their latest book, Smuggled. Thanks all for joining us. And good night.